Welcome, welcome back to the Elevate Your Life podcast. I am so thrilled and honored to have a very dear friend of mine on the show with us today, and she is sharing all about her story of resilience. If you find yourself going from one storm to the next lately and are struggling to adapt with the tides and find yourself amongst all the change that's never ending, this episode is for you. Rachel literally defines resilience, starting with her own three pediatric brain surgeries. She continues to forge on as an advocate, special needs mom, athlete, and loyal friend. She graduated way back from Penn State with honors, lived in Washington, D.C., then found her way to South Florida, spent 10 years in corporate America, and chose to venture out on her own as an entrepreneur to follow her dreams in nutrition and wellness so that she could be a stay-at-home mom. However, life threw a few curveballs, just a few, okay, along the way, um, which has now left her as a special needs mom, brain injury advocate, and currently redefining her relationships. You guys, this episode was extremely vulnerable. I asked Rachel some very defining questions and the look in her eyes told me everything that it takes to get through the storm and to be that strong pillar. So if you're struggling with that right now and don't feel like you have the support system and people that you can go to and honestly share like what the heck is happening, how do you move through, how do you get to the other side and how do you continue to find your light and find what lights you up and do that for yourself and give back, there is hope on the other side. And I know that you have it in you and you are resilient. Rely on us, okay? Borrow the resilience from Rachel in this episode because it's going to serve you really well. I'm so grateful to have her in my life and I'm grateful to be sharing this conversation with you. Rachel, I'm so excited to have you here with me today. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Eliana. Mm, it's an honor. It is. Um, we were just saying how this day was a long time coming because we have these conversations all the time. And I found it so fitting to bring you onto the show because your story is so inspiring. And um, and that's a story of resilience. And um, so before we start, I would love for you to introduce yourself and let our listeners know more about you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eliana. So, gosh, um, I am Rachel. I'm a mom. I'm a trainer. I'm a nutritionist. I'm an athlete. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a woman of many hats. Um, a lot of hats. But um, it's been a very interesting journey. And um, yeah, I guess, you know, part of my journey is just rolling with the punches you know, being the, the boat in the ocean and rolling with the punches and whatever life and whatever God hands me and figuring out how to take the next step and do it with grace and with honor and do what's right for my family. So here I am. So thank you. I mean, gosh, we've known each other for nearly 10 years and life was far different and it's far different than I ever thought it would ever be, but here we are and it's beautiful and it's wonderful and I cherish your friendship. So thank you for having me. Aww. I cherish you too. I remember, so Rachel was one of my first mom friends that I ever had because like she said, we met 10 years ago and 10 years ago, I didn't have many friends that had kids at the time. Um, but I knew Rachel and she had a son and what we would do is we would meet at the parks to have our mom dates while Luke played. And I thought it was such a genius idea because instead of trying to keep your kid like well-mannered and entertained while we have our time, like let them play, you know, let them enjoy themselves while we have our time. So I was like, I'm taking mental note of that. And now 10 years <laughs> later, when my girlfriends say, Hey, you know, we'd love to see you. I go, perfect. Let's grab smoothies and meet at the park. <laughs> You have to figure out how to make the best use of your time all the time. <laughs> yes, you do. Um, so I'd love to share a little bit about, you know, what resilience actually means. Because when you break it down, um, you've experienced resilience in so many areas of your life as a mother, as a woman that has gone through many different seasons of transition in your life and seasons of um 
you know, separation as well from, from a partner and what that entails and how to stand firm, right? As you said, being that boat in the storm. Um, so I want to open us up with the actual definition of resilience because we probably have an idea in our minds what it is and resilience can mean many things to many people, but resilience is the capacity to withstand or to recover quickly from difficulties. It is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or even significant sources of stress. So with that, <laughs> I had no idea that was the definition. This is wild. Yeah. I mean, again, like you said, you have this idea of what it means, but yeah, I really do define that, don't I? You do. Resilient Rachel. We get to rename my, uh, my brand. Oh my God. <laughs> I swear to God, every time I think of you, I think of the most resilient woman. I consider her superwoman and wonder woman because of what she's able to endure. And I admire that because it shows me the limits of my own capacity. And you have so much capacity to hold and and withstand. So, um, you know, kick us off because... It didn't just happen out of thin air, right? If you didn't ask for this. <laughs> um, no. And 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 I want to peel back to when this all kind of began with the car accidents. Yeah. So, you know, there was there was two major life altering car accidents. So start with the first one for us. Yeah. So um, seven years ago now. Yeah, seven years ago, I um, I was training to compete in another competition, a fitness competition, and was in a car accident and hurt my back pretty bad. Um, you know, detoured, derailed my, you know, idea of when my next competition was. And I thought it was just going to be a six to 12 month blip <laughs> and I'd be back to, you know, life as it was, you know, with a two year old and, uh, I guess he was three. He was three. And, um, you know, what was going to happen next? And a year later after that, just when I thought I was back on my feet, um, I had a pretty bad seizure and it woke me up to some other medical stuff that I had going on that I wasn't experiencing any problems with for quite some time. And, um, so that <laughs> slowed me down for a little while again. And then, um, you know, my son was preparing for kindergarten and two weeks before kindergarten started, we were in a near fatal car accident. Um, and that was a year after that was first two accident. years after that first accident. Yeah. So 2019, um, it was awful. It was awful. Um, my son was trauma hawk to the nearest pediatric, um, ICU, um, I was sent to another hospital. I mean, it was, it was the, you know, my phone was destroyed in the accident. I had no way to communicate. Um, it was, it was terrifying. You know, I had a, my son had just turned five, so he's teeny tiny. <laughs> and now I'm being separated from my child. And, um, you know, thankfully his father was able to go to the hospital and be with him, but it took me 24 hours to get transferred to a different hospital. Um, I was in, I was admitted for a week. My son was admitted for seven weeks. Um, he was intubated and sedated in a coma for three weeks while his little body healed. Um, he had two brain surgeries, two internal surgeries, and an orthopedic surgery in those three weeks. Um, it was, it was devastating. And, um, you know, it was after, after we got home that, you think you know what's coming and it just continues to, to evolve and to change and to, um, to test, to test and figure out, you know, what do you do next? How do you handle this? You know, how do you, how do you stay focused on the immediate without thinking too far in the future yet? How do you think in the future to keep yourself present? Like it, it was such an interesting experiment, <laughs> if you will, um, and it, and it changed it, you know, that accident changed our lives. It changed all three of our lives. Um, you know, Luke's father, we were together at the time. We're now separated. Um, we've been separated for a long time. We're in the middle of a divorce and, you know, how do you co-parent 
now a child with disabilities and limitations and, you know, move on from that. And, um, you know, we're doing it. Um, but, you know, we, I do it with, with faith, with family, with friends, with community. You know, they say it takes a village. Boy, does it take a village. Yeah. Um, you know, learning how to advocate for myself even more, learning how to advocate for my son, um, and just stand firm and, and faithful that it's all going to work out. And I will never forget when the accident first happened and we were separated and I got to the hospital and my son was taken to another hospital. And I remember being put into the CT scanner and just bawling, just crying with angst that this is, had happened. And I just, I stopped myself and I said, no, I said, this is not going to be the way this story ends. You know, and I sat there with, with, with this knowingness in my heart and I felt all of the emotions of my son getting out of the hospital, my son graduating kindergarten, my son graduating elementary school. He was going to be the kid that's on stage at high school, you know, speaking about, you know, overcoming life and, you know, learning how to drive and having this independent life. And I, I just, I sat in it, but not just you know, the mental talk of it, but like the knowingness in my heart and the feeling of watching him experience these things in his life. And that was it. That was it. And, um, from that moment on, I just had that, that faith and that vision and that knowingness in my heart. And I used that to propel our, our recovery. Um, I basically shattered my pelvis. I broke my pelvis, my, acetabulum, which is like your, your, what locks into your femur. Um, I broke my pubic bone, my sacrum, my iliac, two ribs, uh, you know, I mean, it was, it was traumatic, but you know, we, we figured out how to do it. And, you know, even on, you know, we, we are not short of, of difficult days, but when I have those days, I think about how far we've come and it's almost unbelievable how far we've come how far he's come, how much he's overcome. And I know that, you know, my ability to remain calm, cool, collected, to be that firm person for him and that loving support for him. And it's just, it's, it's so amazing. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> I love how you made that decision in the very beginning. You said, no, this is not how this story will end. And you decided right then and there how you're going to show up through the difficult days. And now you can look back as the accident was in 2019 and look how far you've come. Um, walk us through um, how it has changed the way you do life, you know, since then, right? You, you obviously have a different lens now, but what has changed in the way that you do life now versus the way you did life before? Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I used to be a full-time business owner and really now I'm a full-time mom. Um, you know, yes, we're separated and he, you know, spends time with his father, but when he's not with his father, I'm dealing with insurance companies and doctors and I take him to therapies. Um, you know, we do a lot of alternative therapies and we're blessed to be able to have access to them here in South Florida and all of the, you know, resources that we have. Um, that's one of the reasons why I chose to stay here is, you know, we have like 4 million people in the Tri-County area and there's a lot of resources here. So, you know, we do equine therapy and speech therapy and um, just lots of immersive experiences. I have him at a children's garden where he can play and do grounding and, you know, just, a, it, it, it's a really neat place. You know, you can reach a lot of things um, virtually and we've been able to access a lot virtually, but the things that we have here in person that I've been able to work with him on, um, yeah, like four days a week, he's he's got something on his schedule. Um, we're very regimented. He goes, he does not go to school full time yet. He's still, you know, in school part time um, because he does have a traumatic brain injury and he just, he gets tired. Um, you know, it's, I think of it like a wind up toy mm -hmm. and, you know, there's only so much energy and he hits like this brick wall at like 11 o'clock every day. And it doesn't matter if he still sleeps 10 or 11 hours a night. I'm very regimented in my house. Um, you know, being that 
nutrition is my specialty. I'm like very strict on what he eats and what he doesn't eat because what we eat affects our insides and affects our temperament and affects yeah. our gut. You know, and he had, um, he had massive injuries to his spleen and his liver and, and his kidney. And so since then, like his body can't tolerate wow. the same things that other people would. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, <laughs> How do you manage that when you go out to eat or around part like birthday parties and things like that? You know, it's because nutrition has always been my thing. He's not, he doesn't even enjoy the typical things that other kids would eat. Like he still to this day won't eat um, fruit snacks. He won't eat like junk popsicles. Like, you know, he's the kid who eats like a couple of bites of cake and then puts it away. Um, so I guess that kind of, you know, was before our big thing now, um, is he can't eat red food. So, um, tomato. Mm -hmm. So, and you think, well, you don't eat tomato. Like a kid doesn't eat a tomato on a hamburger, but pizza. Yeah. But you know, pasta, anybody, sauce. You know, pasta sauce, you go to and these terrible school lunches, you know, it's like mozzarella cheese stick, cheese pizza crunchers, like everything at school has red sauce. Mm. So, you know, I've gotten inventive in his lunch boxes and what he can pack for those days. And, you know, yeah. I mean, my husband knows I'm the sugar police in my house. Yes. Um, and when we met, he would take four sugars in his coffee, like <laughs> kill me. Okay. <laughs> That's what I started with. And now he's down to one. So we're, 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 we're doing good. Yes. Um, so, you know, you don't all of a sudden start to like become this different person all overnight, right? In order to withstand the storm, you continuously evolve along the way as the storm evolves with you. Um, what are some of the things that you've done to rebuild yourself to have that mental fortitude of steel? So um, I did I did do some personal development um, in a group setting prior to the accident, um, which was very helpful. Um, it helped me reconnect with other people. Yes, I knew you. Um, but, you know, when you are in a marriage and you have a young child, you'll find a lot of times that you end up disconnected from people. And so um, thankfully to this this group training that I had done, I had a, a decent amount of people in my life that I could really reach out to and, and rely on. But the key is that you have to be willing to ask for help. And so um, prior to these trainings, I was always the person I was wonder woman who was superwoman. I didn't yeah. need anybody to help me. I would do it all on my own. And so I'll never forget when I was in that first emergency room Somebody from those trainings came into the, I, I was still in, I was still in the ICU that first 24 hours. And just to um, identify what the training was, is this the Course of Miracles? You're no, to? this is uh, the gratitude training okay. community that I, and they're, they're, they still exist in other facets, but yeah. um, this woman who was a coach in the, the series, and then she and I had actually would, were working on another project together and she came into me and she said, what's your lesson? And I said, the giver gets to receive. Wow. But in receiving, but in receiving, you have to ask, especially in a traumatic time like that, because people don't know what you need. And a lot of times, you know, unless you've experienced something traumatic like that, you don't even know where to turn. You don't even know how to help. You know, even the simple question of asking somebody, you know, how are you? can break somebody down. Yeah. So it's not, how are you? It's, it's, how are you today? Or what, how can I help you today? And it's the little things. And so, um, you know, again, I had to be courageous and ask for how people could help me because they don't know. Mm -hmm. and a lot of times people want to help you, but they don't even know how to do it or, yeah. or how to ask. Or So you have to be willing to speak up for yourself mm -hmm. and um, take ownership of that. Yeah, that's really powerful. I think a lot of women can relate to that because we we think we can do it all on our own and we don't want to ask for help, right? But it takes a village, especially when you go through a traumatic event and you don't have all the answers and you need that support to fall back on so that you can feel stronger, right? Support doesn't mean you're weak. Support means that you get stronger. Exactly. Yeah, that's really powerful. Um, so let's dive into you know, in the midst of the separation, because 
it's enough to have, <laughs> like, let's just add another layer to this. <laughs> or two or three. Yeah. Um, and this is why I think you are absolutely remarkable because it's not just one thing that took place. It's the compounding effect of everything that took place, right? So you had the traumatic, um, not one, but two life altering car accidents. You have a special needs child now. And then in the midst of that, going through the separation, how did you maintain, um, being there for your child in a calm way when the background, there's so much chaos, right? I think, so many times, like I come from a divorced home where it can be all out in the open for the children to experience and they absorb. So how have you maintained that so that your son doesn't absorb best as you can, of course? I, yeah, that's that's an interesting question um, because I do come from a divorced family myself. Um, and so, you know, I know different people have different experiences when their families go through divorce. I was very fortunate in that my parents were actually divorced before I was born. Mm. And so, but my father and my mother never fought. They never argued over money. They never argued over child support. They never argued over anything. Um, if I wanted to go live with one, I was able to go live with one. If I wanted to go live with the other. So there was a lot of fluidity and flexibility. And so I was very blessed in that, but you know, and my dad remarried very, you know, relatively, you know, when I was young and my mom had different dating experiences. So I got to see that side. Um, but I realized that, that I, I had to be true to myself and what was making me happy and staying in a relationship that wasn't serving me and, wasn't serving my family, wasn't serving my son. Like as a woman, when, when I was staying in a relationship that I was miserable, that I didn't feel like I was being treated the way I wanted to be treated, wasn't teaching my son how to treat a woman in the way that I wanted to be treated. And so for me, it was just this knowingness that as a woman, I also have a responsibility to teach my son how to treat a woman. Absolutely. So it, it was just, again, it was just like this internal, like force that came out of me that reminded me like there are many, we have so many hats as moms. We have so many hats as wives and as partners and, and we have to get to take ownership of what we choose to tolerate, to give, to receive um, what our boundaries and our standards are, and then be that example for not only our children, but our communities and everything else. And so it was just a decision that, you know, that had to be made. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we did it, it was, you know, honoring that we weren't going to argue. Like we clearly are getting divorced because, you know, there are reasons why people get divorced, but that we weren't going to let that affect our child. And that, at the end of the day, after everything that he's been through, he deserved to have the best. He deserves to have two happy parents. It's like you experienced in your household growing up. Exactly. And, um, you know, it, it, it's not easy. You know, nobody, I think, gets married to get divorced. Um, but, you know, it was, it was looking at the bigger picture. Yeah. You know, how, how, does, how does that affect you and your family when, when neither person is happy? Mm -hmm. Um, so let's dive into, to hear more on that in particular, you know, like I recall growing up where you go from one house to the other and there's a period of adjustment. There's a period of maybe the child's venting about an experience they had with their other parent and it, it can be positive. It can be negative, right? Or it can be just what their experience is. And you know, that it wasn't exactly how that child was supposed to be treated or what was supposed to take place. Or, you know, you have that more, you have more understanding of course than they do. They're just sharing what is right. How do you navigate uh, while keeping that container for him? That's a really, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I believe that, you know, it only takes one, I, I know from my own personal experience, it only took one person to see me, to understand me, to be there for me. And for me in my life, that was always my grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, she always listened to me with open arms, 
no matter what I had to say about her own child, who was my mother, or, you know, my father, who she was trying to respect as, you know, the father of her grandchild. Um, and so when, when he comes to me, you know, I just try to be a safe sounding board. Um, you know, not pay it too much attention um, because we both love him. You know, each parent is doing the best that they can with the knowledge that you have based on the way that we were raised, you know? And so even though we're not together, you know, I still have respect for him as my son's father. You know, he, he does truly love his son. He's just doing the best that he can. And so all I can do is assure him, mommy loves you. Daddy loves you. If he needs somebody else to talk to, find him somebody else to talk to so that he has that safe place and let him know that it's okay when he's with me and that I'll always be there to, to, to have these conversations with him. And then, you know, there's a level of deflection to it too. Um, I want him to get it off his chest, but I don't want him to focus on it. Mm -hmm. So then I just focus on our time that's coming up and, and the fun things that we're going to go do and just really be that space for him. Yeah. That's really powerful because it's so easy to get caught up in the details of it. Right. Um, but I love how you recognized that it takes one person to see you, to understand you, to hear you, for you to feel safe within yourself and to feel validated and to know that you have someone in your corner that's not trying to steer you in any which direction other than your own guiding light. Um, that's really powerful. Thank you. Um, so, you know, along the way, I'm sure there's been moments where, like you said, you went from being a business owner to a mother. And for many women that want to have more in their lives than just be a mom, because for some reason we've told ourselves that being a mom isn't enough. <laughs> How did that, sh the, the, the identity shift is really where I want to head to in this. Um, how did you shift identities and being secure within yourself and in this new chapter in your life, um, adjusting all the, all the things that you now get to do? Yeah. So, um, you know, <laughs> there's a level of joy in separation. Um, <laughs> when, you know, it, it's like, you know, I tease and I call school free daycare, <laughs> You know, the doctor tries like, hey, are you available for an appointment this day? I'm like, no, I don't have any daycare that day. <laughs> I mean, school. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, separation is kind of like that. And again, you get to make a choice. I got to make a choice. I can either be miserable on the days I don't have my child, or I can find joy and fill my cup in those days. And so for me, um, you know, I quickly leaned into my friendships. Um, I leaned into reading books to watching TV that I wanted to watch. I didn't have to fight over the remote anymore. You know, I could watch what I wanted to watch. Um, going to the beach and, you know, grounding and shelling. I mean, if you follow me on social media, like I love going to the beach, shelling, watching the sunrise, like that's my thing. Um, and just, and, you know, again, go back to my days of enjoying competing. And so, you know, being in the gym and working out and finding out what sparks, you know, what lights that spark again, and then just following it. Yeah. Um, listening to the call when it comes from within. Mm -hmm. And that's something you've always had. Like you've always had this innate ability to want to help others and inspire others whether that be through um, personal training and nutrition um, and helping other women ignite their light. And I love that you've been able to uh, maintain your light by embracing this new season and still finding things that light you up, right? Like this woman is at the beach at least three to four times a week for sunrise. At like 6 a.m. <laughs> it inspired me so much that I said, okay, for the new year, I used to go to the beach all the time and without it, I feel like there's a part of me that's missing. And so I said to myself, okay, new year, I can make it to the sunrise at least once a month. Like I can do that. Like make this, like set the bar so low that you can't fail. Okay. And then every time you increase that, you, you know, you can show up for it. So Rachel was my accountability partner. Cause I know she's going to be there no matter what. <laughs> 
And we turned it into a play date. We did. Yeah, <laughs> Little Man had such a great time. Um, and I'm actually going to go again before the end of this month, this weekend, which I'm looking forward to. Um, but in the in the midst of that, you found what lights you up and you make sure that you make it a priority, um, even as much as getting back into competing. So talk a little bit about that. What inspired <laughs> you to get back into competing? Oh, that's actually kind of a funny story. And it, 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 it was very haphazard. So again, it's listening to it when it calls, um, you know. I was in a wheelchair for two years after the accident. It took me two years to get done with physical therapy for the second time um, and just get back to any working out. Um, So I had to get through the level of pain and, you know, get to the point where I could be consistent. And thankfully, my nutrition's always been on. So, you know, I didn't didn't gain a lot of weight despite all these injuries and everything else. Um, But so, you know, I've been fielding questions probably almost all of 2023. People would be like, are you going to compete again? And I'm like, no, no, I'm not competing. And so in January, I took pictures and I just like to take pictures, um, you know, front, back, side, just to kind of follow my progress maybe twice a year. And um, I was seeing somebody and they were like, oh, send me your pictures. And I'm like, I'm not sending you those pictures. <laughs> those are like my personal pictures. Like, you know, the boring pictures that you take of yourself and then you like send nice pictures. To yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I was like being all silly and I'm like, let me put on my posing suit and see what I look like. And I saw and I was like, holy cow. I was like, I'm a lot closer than I realized I was. Wow. Because again, I was so caught up in the the doing of the mom responsibilities and then, you know, filling my cup and doing and doing and doing it. I hadn't really stopped to take a look at myself in that regards. And so I was like, wow, I was like, you know what? I think we should compete this year. Let's, uh, why not? Exactly. And, um, I haven't selected a show yet or anything like that, but I'm just beginning the process and it's exciting. It's really exciting because the last time I got on stage was 2016 So that was eight years ago. Wow. And, you know, the federations have changed. The posing has changed. The the look has changed. Like, everything has changed. So it's going to be an exciting journey. And what particular um, type of show are you leaning towards? So I'm leaning towards Bikini again. And I'm looking at the OCB Federation. Um, It's an all-natural, tested federation. And... um, it seems to have a decent presence in Florida, so I don't have to do much traveling. Um, I'm already doing some research on a coach because all coaches need a coach. Um, you know, even psychotherapists. They tell psychotherapists, like, you need a psychotherapist. Like, the, the, like, the minute you stop, the minute you stop learning, you die. Like, that is my theory. Like, I'm always looking for growth and for knowledge. And so, you know, yes, I'm a coach. So one of the important things I'm looking for in a coach is somebody that's willing to collaborate and listen to me too, because I come with 19 years of experience. Mm. Um, So yeah, so I'm like interviewing coaches myself and it's just really exciting. That's fun. Yeah, that is really fun. Um, So along the way, you mentioned that you had um, somebody that you were seeing. Yes. And I think that's important for us to dive into next because... (laughs) Like dating post <laughs> marriage, right? <laughs> oh. And I want to go there particularly because, you know, you've inspired me in the way that you were able to, you know, know what you want in someone and what you don't, right? Obviously, you come from um, an experience of knowing what you did not want. So now when you're dating people, you know, share with us a bit about how you remain in your divine feminine and know when okay, this doesn't feel right, or it's time to move on? Oh, so um, just for a little precursor here, this this separation has been four years, so it's been a long time. Um, I didn't date for the first two years, but, um, you know, I really sat down and did some journaling first, and I really thought about the qualities that I was looking for in a man, some that weren't like my husband, some that were like my husband that I, you know, obviously attracted me to him. So I got to be honest with what attracted me to him. And then what else was I looking for? So I journaled and I had this list and on there had nothing to do with height, had nothing to do with, you know, physique, even though I'm an athlete and a competitor, like, yeah, that's, 
there's a, a level of self care that's required. Um, but it wasn't, you know, anything specific. Like, you know, sometimes people are like, I want six foot tall and brown hair and blue eyes and, you know, da, 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 da. And I, it wasn't like that. It was like, um, emotional intelligence and vulnerability and like things that as I've done the work over the years that I was clear on what I wanted. And so, um, you know, in the beginning it was online dating because I spent or online pursuing or online, what do you even call that? Like, um, <laughs> it wasn't pursuing, I don't know, like <laughs> online looking, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was like, I would look through like people's, like it, I, I never joined Facebook dating, but like, you know, Facebook like recommends like who you should, you know, browsing, online browsing. Online browsing, there we go. <laughs> so I'm like online browsing and I'd look at these people and I'm like, you know, and, and so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> And then, you know, as you go and meet people, it's just like, you know, it's just like a a girlfriend connection too. Like when you meet people on the street, you instantly, like there is an instant, yeah, I like them. I don't like them. I want to know more about them. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. it was just being honest with like listening to that, that beacon inside of me of like, oh, that might be interesting. Um, And so, yeah, so it's, it's been interesting, but now that time has gone on, I'm back at this, like, I think I'm just going to be solo for a while and continue to taking care of what needs to get taken care of. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I've moved through, you know, dating a few different people, um, it was constantly honing that list. I've pulled that list back out. I've looked to see what's still relevant on the list, what needs to be changed, what needs to come off. How does that one word not really define it? Maybe there's a tweaking of that word. Um, yeah. So it's just, and then as I meet people, you know, as you go down the checklist, um, just being very honest with myself mm-hmm. and that, you know, the next relation, like real relationship I'm in, I want them to check as many of those boxes as I can or as they can. And, you know, I'm not expecting anybody to check all of those boxes instantly because again, what did I say earlier? I believe that the minute we stop growing, we die. So the first thing is And I don't need to impose that this person needs to grow or change, but seeing that person for their ability to grow and change. Um, Actually, one one of the people that I dated um, explained to me at one point in time, there were three different types of people. And this was like, this is something clearly I carry with myself. (laughs) But he said, there are people that, um, that want to change. There are people that change. And then there's people that, are incapable of changing. Mm. Yeah, makes sense. And it was something that it was just like, that was like the light that goes off. Yeah. And so like now when I meet people, men, women, um, friends, potential, you know, suiters, I'm always, and I'm, I'm just thinking about that in the mm-hmm. background. Are they know? open or closed? Are they set in their ways or is there room for, yeah. like, do they have similar beliefs on change and growth and, and things like that? There has to be, like, a desire to want better for themselves. Like, I want better for myself, so I'm open to changing, like, evolving, right? right? Um, and that goes for any person. But, you know, while you were um, in that in that realm and dating and, you know, I really admired how you recognized when someone that might have said they were willing or open turns out to be closed and that wall comes up. And I think so many women that are, you know, dating don't know when it's the right time to leave or move on, right? How did you make those decisions and really honor yourself and your path? Because it can be really easy to get stuck in situations. Yeah, it can. Um, Again, you know, we can we can choose to make a change when it's easier or we can choose to make a change when you're faced with a near death experience. Mm. And so, you know, I very, I clearly had this life altering experience that showed me that we're not promised tomorrow. And so again, I have to, I get to be brutally honest with myself in regards to friendships whether it's male, female, family, there's family I've chose to walk away from. Again, what makes me happy every day? I get to to protect, to create and protect my space every day. 
even the guy that's driving by you honking his horn or, you know, whatever they're doing. Like Mm -hmm. my bubble is my bubble and I get to choose every day what goes in that bubble. And so if that person can't bring me joy and, and they're not bringing me joy, their presence, their energy, their relationship with me, bring me joy. The, if you can't move through it to a point where you can grow it and keep it sustainable, life's too short. I don't want to be, I have friends to connect with. I have TV shows to watch. I have a son to snuggle. Like I, I have the ocean that's calling my name. Mm. You know, I can go to the park and plug in. Like I have so many resources and we all do. And, and, Figuring out what makes you happy and then plugging into those things when you need to, whether it's people, whether it's environment, whether it's location, whether it's a book, find it, do it and follow your heart because you have this moment and only this moment. Mm. I freaking love that. And I think if more people lived life knowing that you're not promised tomorrow, they would live life radically honest yeah. with themselves. You know, it's it's so easy to fall into um, like the pleasing aspect and not wanting to like hurt anybody or step on their toes or not make them feel bad or disappoint. And all the while you're disappointing yourself. Exactly. More than anybody else. Yep. And compounding that day after day after day when you disappoint yourself when you lie to yourself when you cut yourself short when you don't do the things that let you up when you don't plug in to that book or that sunrise or that park or you know the people that light you up it diminishes your light and then you've only become miserable to the people around you and now you're not serving the people around you either Mm. and that's where becoming brutally honest with who you are what you need asking for it and then choosing what serves you and doesn't serve you. And, and that's, that's all you can do. So what has been, now that you're on the other side, I'll say, <laughs> um, and we've built up so many new traits and qualities, you know, the last decade, right, that have carried you through. I mean, this woman... I don't worry about her. She knows how to weather any storm now of anything. And, you know, you've become that beacon of hope and light for so many women in your community, myself included. Um, uh. (laughs) Um, And I'm curious, what would be three words that you would describe as yourself, the woman you are today? It's so easy to think of us when we were before, but the woman you are today It'll be three words you would use to describe yourself. Mm. Mm. Good. <laughs> uh, let's see. No. <laughs> do, 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 do. Um, no, capable, strong, and loving. Mm. Yes. Those are really good. Yes, you are. Thank you. Yeah. I see you. I see you. I always have. And I just think it's so amazing. So beautiful. Like, the way our friendship started, I tell people this and they must think I'm crazy. I'm like, you just have to meet this girl. Like we like, and I just, I I love our story of our friendship and to see you grow and evolve. And clearly I have grown and evolved and, you know, just, and I can't wait to see what the next decade brings both of us. Oh my gosh, me too. So before we tune out, last but not least, um, all of our listeners get to hear from each of our guests. What does elevating your life mean to you? Oh, again, if you stop growing, you're dead. Mm. So, you know, we get a choice. You know, we can stay the same. Every day the sun rises and sunsets. What if every day, like, the sun just stayed? That'd be kind of boring. And so every day it's evolving and it's changing and we can stay the same or we can elevate. And by elevating, we, we get to grow. I mean, I like, there's so many meanings to it. It's just, <laughs> it, 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 oh, it's just beautiful. You just have to embrace it. And, and the minute you embrace it, 
it's literally like watching the sunrise. Like I have seen some of the most magnificent sunrises in the last year. And, and that's like, if, if you've never seen it or even a sunset, but go see something that magnificent and that's what it is. And like every day you can make your life better and it doesn't rely on anybody else. Nobody else. It can all be from within mm-hmm. and, and every day can be that much better. Like a math problem. Like, <laughs> like when you square something and square something and square something like that. <laughs> Oh my God. That's what I was going to say. My takeaway was in this conversation and it just changed to like a math problem. <laughs> I don't know. <sighs> oh my God. Um, all right. So please tell everyone where they can find you on Instagram and ways that they can connect with you. Yes. You can find me on Instagram at rise up with Rachel and, um, yeah, just check me out. I'd love to connect with you and uh, learn more about you and be in service of you and see what beautiful things you're bringing to this planet and to our community. So yes, you're going to see so many incredible sunrise pictures. The, and she goes shell picking. So you're going to also see the most um, exquisite and unique and exotic shells that I didn't even know we had in South Florida on the East coast. Okay. Um, And you get to support her on her journey as she competes. So Go follow Rachel on social, connect with her, share your love with her, share your story with her. I would love to hear actually um, what part of this episode resonated with you the most. Um, I know we have a lot of um, moms that tune in and women that go through all different stages in life. So I'd love to hear what part of Rachel's journey stood out to you the most. Rachel, thank you so much for coming here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And I love that we got to do this episode together, sitting side by side, not virtually, which makes us so much more fun. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) I love, I love being in your space and sharing our energy. Thank Mm -hmm. you. Thank you.